Think about what happens at Starbucks when you order your favorite venti triple shot latte with seven caramel syrup pumps. Oh, and extra cinnamon powder too. If you're a walk-in customer, the process often starts even before you get to the front of the line when the barista asks you what drink you're ordering. They write your name in the cup, maybe you order a bagel as well, which they throw into their fancy warming oven. You pay for your order. Wait, is it 2005? No, it's 2025. You pay with your phone. They start on your drink by measuring the milk and steaming it. Then the flavor pumps go into your cup. Then the barista cues three espresso shots by pushing a button. To finish the drink, they pour the milk and sprinkle on the cinnamon. The drink goes in the bar and they call your name. Meanwhile, the bagel comes out of the oven and goes into a bag, which goes in the bar as well. A lot of this action is roughly analogous to the way your CPU executes instructions, and developing an understanding of this can help you write faster code. Just like Starbucks wants to serve as many customers per day as possible, you want your CPU to execute as many instructions per second as possible. Waiting time is also extremely important, and it's what customers really care about. They want their caffeine and sugar, and they want it now. Starbucks' new CEO has a goal to get latency under four minutes. The company is implementing changes to improve efficiency, such as automation upgrades and changes to drink sequencing. Just like at Starbucks, CPU instructions execute in a pipeline. Each instruction is decoded into one or more micro-operations, and lots of these micro-ops are in flight at the same time. There are two important things to know about the pipeline. The first thing to know is that the micro-ops execute out of order. The CPU wants to keep those execution ports busy, so it scans way ahead to find instructions that are ready to go. The instruction buffer is huge, containing hundreds of micro-ops on the latest CPUs. This means that if you have some code that's blocking on accessing memory, it might not matter if there's other useful stuff to do. The CPU ensures that although the instructions internally execute out of order, the architectural state is coherent to the program. Instructions are retired in their original sequence, unlike Starbucks orders. Retirement means that the effect of the instruction is fully committed. The second important thing is that there are multiple execution units, or ports, in the CPU that operate in parallel. High-end CPUs tend to have more execution units, while low-end models and efficiency cores have fewer just like some high-traffic Starbucks locations have more staff and equipment. The efficiency core is like the little Starbucks embedded in your grocery store with only one person working. The execution units are not all created equal. On a modern CPU, all of the integer ALUs are going to be able to do addition and subtraction, but maybe only one of them could do division. This can create a bottleneck if, for example, you need to do a lot of division. It's like how Starbucks can't mix more than one Frappuccino at a time if there's only one blender. Except, actually they do. In practice, the blender is a vector execution unit. Some operations complete in a single cycle, others take much longer. Memory loads and division can be very slow. Unlike the blender, modern CPU execution units are pipelined. Each one can have multiple micro-ops in progress at a time. What really matters is dependency chains. This is where the Starbucks analogy breaks down. On a CPU, the output of one instruction is almost always used as the input of another instruction. But nobody's going into Starbucks and asking for another customer's cafe Americano to be poured into their Frappuccino. In this ARM64 example, the two multiply instructions can execute in parallel on different execution units because their inputs are independent but the add instruction depends on the multiplication results, so it can't start until those are done. It's easy to see when you draw a graph of your dependencies, and we can scale the graph to show that multiplication is slower than addition. When you have a lot of calculations to do, the latency will most likely depend on the time to execute that longest chain. But perhaps you can get something useful done in parallel on the other paths, like ordering a bagel since you know you're gonna be waiting for that latte. Here, it's possible to save a cycle in the critical path. Can you see it? We can save a cycle by regrouping the additions so that the CPU can perform two of them at a time. The optimizing compiler can easily find simple stuff like this for you. Another way the Starbucks analogy breaks down is in branching. Here we have a trivial for loop. The next line of code to run depends on whether i is less than 20. 
Here's what it looks like in ARM64 assembly. The BNE instruction is a conditional branch, and the next instruction to run depends on the results of previous instructions. When the decoder gets to the conditional branch, it doesn't know what instruction to decode next. Remember, it's decoding dozens of instructions ahead, writing names on cups to fill up the reorder buffer. If the branch isn't taken, then the execution falls through to the next instruction. However, if the branch is taken, then the next instruction is the add at the top of the loop. There are of course more instructions that follow in both possible paths, and more branches on those paths, and branches on those paths, and so on. CPUs don't have the capacity to decode and execute all these multiple possible timelines. So what they do is they guess. And they're really good at it. The CPU keeps track of branch history, and it can accurately predict patterns and loop iteration counts. It's like a barista that sees you walk in and starts your regular Tuesday cappuccino. The branch prediction can be right 95% of the time or better. The cool thing about this is that it can move the calculation of the conditional out of your critical path if there are no other dependencies. The CPU goes ahead and executes the predicted branch while calculating the conditional in parallel. The results of the predicted instructions aren't committed until the branch is confirmed. This is tracked in the reorder buffer. When the CPU eventually gets to the branch, it's hopefully just a formality to confirm that the prediction was correct. However, if the branch is predicted incorrectly, then the CPU has to pour out all the drinks that it made wrong and then restart taking orders from the correct location. As you can see, this is very disruptive, can cost a lot of CPU cycles. Branch prediction doesn't work so well when the branches are random. By definition, random data is not predictable. This is what's happening on some code that I'm porting to run in my new MacBook Pro, which has an Apple Silicon ARM64 chip. I discussed this function in an earlier video. I use it to draw random cards from a deck in my side project, which is an AI that plays the pandemic board game. The hand or deck of cards is represented as a bit set in my code. The function starts by counting the number of bits in the hand using the pop count intrinsic. Then it generates a random number k between 0 and that count. It then clears the lowest set bit k times. After k iterations, the index of the lowest set bit is the result. This code causes a lot of branch mispredictions because the loop executes a random number of times. This function is a bottleneck for my code. It was eating 12% of my CPU. For x86, I used an instruction pdep to eliminate the branches and make this code four times as fast. pdep lets me do a bit scattering operation to isolate the card I want in just three cycles. ARM64 has an analogous bdep instruction, which I had hoped to use. bdep is part of ARM v9, and according to Wikipedia, back in January when I bought this computer, the M4 CPU uses ARM v9. But much to my chagrin, Wikipedia wasn't quite up to date. It turns out Apple only supports most of the ARM v9 features and not the scalable vector extension, which includes BDEP. I still hoped I could find a way to make this faster. Here's the disassembly. The problematic loop is here. I believe each iteration should only cost a few cycles because the instructions to update the cards are independent of the instructions to decrement k and branch if it's not zero. They should execute in parallel on different execution units. However, in the worst case, there could be 64 loop iterations taking over 100 cycles. Initially, I looked for a way to reduce the number of loop iterations in those worst cases. If k is a large number, then the deck would have to be pretty dense, and it might make sense to try to process the bits in bulk. Say k is 42, then we know the bit we want can't be in the low 32 bits, so we can count how many 1 bits there are in the low 32 bits and then do a faster search in the high 32 bits. The code on the screen cuts the max possible loop iterations down to 32. I tried a lot of variations of this code, and none of them were faster. The big problem is that I'm still looping and there's still branch mispredictions. Also, the worst case scenarios aren't common in my program, where the number of cards is usually less than 10. I'm analyzing further with the cool tool I just discovered, LLVM's Machine Code Analyzer, MCA, which is available in Compiler Explorer. 
It has a nifty timeline view that shows you how your code might get scheduled and executed by the CPU. There's a row for each instruction. Going from left to right, each column is a clock cycle. An equal sign shows an instruction that's waiting to execute. Usually that's waiting for an input to be ready. The little E's show when an instruction is actually executing. And the dashes show executed instructions that are waiting to retire. The little E's are what I'm looking at. Here, see that the pop count turns out to be pretty expensive on Apple Silicon. It has to be done using the vectorized C and T instruction. It's calculating a byte-wise pop count, then performing a horizontal addition. This involves an expensive round trip to vectorized registers. The total latency is 14 cycles, which is a lot more than the one or two cycles it takes on x86. Note that the MCA is a simulation and it has limitations. It doesn't simulate branch predictions and it doesn't really know what to do about function calls. I had to modify my function to accept a raw random parameter and inline the code that reduces that to a number between zero and the pop count. See my random number video for an explanation of why I'm multiplying instead of taking a modulo. The instructions to generate that randval parameter don't depend on anything in this function, so they won't be in the critical path. The MCA output is based on LLVM's model of your CPU, and that model isn't necessarily perfect. Apple has their own optimization guide, and that lists latencies for the instructions that disagree in some cases with what MCA reports. Unfortunately, Apple's guide is encumbered by a non-disclosure agreement, so I'm not going to quote from it. Anyway, I don't think it's important to be counting every single cycle, but I did find it was very useful in learning about ARM. What I became obsessed with is that bite-wise pop count. That is kind of cool. Thinking about it, I came up with a way to use it to eliminate the while loop. The first thing I do is that I take the byte-wise pop counts and I multiply them by a vector of ones to get a cumulative pop count. I actually do most of these steps using general purpose registers. I'm thinking about the data as bytes and integers at the same time. In the next step, I take my randomly generated number k and I multiply it by that same vector of ones. This broadcasts its value to every byte. Then I subtract the cumulative pop counts and now I have another vector of bytes. The bytes in this vector go from positive to negative at the byte containing the bit I want to use. I need both the value of the byte and its position. The position tells me which byte from the deck contains the kth bit. And the key value tells me which set bit I want inside that byte. All of this work and I still need to find the kth set bit in a number. But that number is now only an 8-bit number, instead of a 64-bit number, which is where I had started, which means I can use a lookup table. The last line in my function looks like this. I'm using that value and shift as the indices into a two-dimensional lookup table. The lookup should only take a few cycles if the table is in the L1 cache. Here's the final code. I'm using some ARM-specific compiler intrinsics now in order to access the bytewise pop count. As you can see, there are no branches. I had to do some annoying crap to handle a corner case, which I won't get into here. There's a lot of code, but it's actually pretty fast. It turns out that more code is better than less code that has a lot of branch mispredictions. Let's take a look at how MCA thinks it will execute. The total simulated execution time is about 40 cycles. Here is the critical path. And here are the instructions that we're able to run in parallel. It seems like maybe there's still some room for improvement, but this is where I've stopped for now. Apple will probably add that beat-up instruction in the M5 and I'll have buyer's remorse. The optimized function is about three times as fast as the original. It's now using less than 2% of the CPU and the total speed up to my AI was about 9%. After optimizing the random card drawing, I turned my attention to another function, assess suits, which was now using about 15% of the CPU time. In the pandemic board game, the players need to collect five cards of the same color in order to cure diseases and win the game. This function's job is to count the cards by suit in each player's hand to determine which player is closest to curing which disease. Based on this, it decides which player should be collecting which suit. 
There's a lot going on in this code. I'm only going to talk about a couple of pieces. The function is slow because of all the pop counts and branches. I'd like to cut those down. In my phmenpauseuw video, I explained the obscure instruction I used to optimize this for x86. Happily, ARM has a similar instruction, umaxv, that will determine the maximum value of 16 bytes. As usual, just to be confusing, the C intrinsic has a different name from the instruction. Unlike Intel phmenpauseuw, umaxv only gives me the value of the maximum element, but not its position. And I need the position. So what I did was I encode the pop counts in the high nibble of each byte and the position in the low nibble, that is, just the numbers from 0 to 15. So if there are two players with, say, four of a kind, umaxv will still have a unique result. And I can use the value of the low nibble to know its position. To set this up in a four-player game, I need 16 pop counts, one pursuit per player. We saw that pop counts are expensive, but they can be performed in bulk on bytes using SIMD instructions. The Pandemic deck has 12 of each suit. Here's what my suit masks look like. With some shifting and masking, I can set this up for some vectorized pop counts and then add the adjacent pairs of bytes to get the 16 pop counts that I need. Here's a snippet from my code showing how I set this up with some SIMD intrinsics. Again, I'm not going to try to walk through everything. Ultimately, I'm setting up that count v variable to contain the 16 pop counts I need. Then I use that umaxv instruction to find the highest pop count. There's a bunch more code I'm not going to go into that processes the value and sets it up for the next iteration. After these optimizations, my AI is running 12% faster when I compile with full optimization. The profiling indicates that the function is about two or three times as fast. That's not bad, but I'll probably revisit at some point to see if I can do better. Aside from the slow pop count, I'm very impressed with the Apple Silicon so far. The laptop is very fast and runs cool and quietly. I've been an Intel programmer my whole life, and now I'm having a lot of fun learning more about ARM. While doing all this Mac optimization, it seemed appropriate to read a book about Apple. Patrick McKee's Apple in China is an interesting read about Apple hardware engineering and the investments and partnerships they've made in China and Taiwan. This is not a technical book, but I'm going to stay in my lane here and talk about the nerd stuff. The book certainly increased my appreciation for the complexities of industrial design and global manufacturing, from injection molding to inventory management. One bit that stuck with me is the story of organized scammers who used fake IDs to purchase new carrier-locked iPhones in the U.S., paying for one month of a two-year contract. They shipped the phones to factories overseas, which disassembled the phones and zapped the chips. The scammers would then take the brand new broken phones into Apple stores in China and demand replacements which they could sell on the gray market. This and other scams is what supposedly drove Apple to implement hardware component pairing technology, which is what makes those phones so hard to repair. Other interesting bits include an English-speaking scholar who found his dyslexia disappeared when learning the logographic Chinese written language and plenty on Apple's unending drive to miniaturize everything to make the thinnest, lightest devices and then manufacture them at amazing scale. Anyways, I enjoyed reading it and I thought I'd share. That's it for this video. I hope you're glad it wasn't about Java.